Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a customer and a shop assistant. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. I'm interested in buying a radio. Can you help me? Yes, of course. As you can see, we have this analogue radio on special offer today for £29.99. They are normally £35. We've also got a much more modern range of digital radios. These are over here. Oh, yes. What are they? They're the new technology. This one, for example, sells at £95. The analogue radios are looking a bit old-fashioned now. Are they? What's so good about these new ones? Well, the main advantage with the analogue ones is, of course, cheapness. But the main advantage with the digital ones is the number and variety of stations you can get. Hundreds of them. All kinds of stations playing music, rock, pop, classical, everything in fact. As well as news, current affairs, comedy, all sorts. Hmm. What about the sound quality? The quality is very good. Under certain circumstances, you can get amazing sound quality with analogue, but this is usually with very expensive radios, which would normally be part of a hi-fi sound system. We have lots of those on the third floor, if you're interested. Mm -hmm. The second great thing about digital is clarity. You get no interference, well, less interference than with analogue. You get a very clear and clean sound. Well, I want a radio for the flat I share with three other friends of mine. Well, you want something that will last. The analogues come with a one-year guarantee, but the digitals have a two-year guarantee, which is extendable to three years if you pay an extra £26. The main disadvantage with analogue is that it will be turned off in a few years. We don't know exactly when, but sometime. Hmm. But what about the batteries? I've heard that they use a lot of batteries. That probably is the one disadvantage of the digital radios. The battery life is not very long, but they all come with rechargeable batteries, which really solves the problem. Before you listen to the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, how would you like to pay? Uh, cash. I wondered if you had a Robson store card? Do you know? I think I do. Uh, here we are. Oh, my goodness. I haven't seen one of those for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> those are the old value cards. Now you can get a super value card, which is even better value. Really? I don't know what to do. Well, I can change you onto a super value card if you want. With the super value card, you get double the standard number of points and your free credit period is longer. With your old card, you get one month's free credit, but you can get three months free credit with the new card. The interest rate is a bit higher at 22.5% rather than 18.5%, but if you're careful, you don't have to pay interest at all. Well, I'm not sure about that. It seems better in some ways. Can I continue to use my old card? You certainly can, until they withdraw them, which I'm sure they will before too long. But with the Super Value card, there are special cardholder-only days. Two per month, compared with one per month with the old card. I see. My old card gave me free delivery, too. That's right. Free delivery within 20 miles. The Super Value card gives you free delivery up to 50 miles. That sounds good. I think the old card was free too. With the Super Value, there is an initial fee of just £12, and then it's very good value. I think I'll pay cash. 
Very good, madam. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear part of an introductory talk about a library. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning. My name is Mandy and I am going to tell you a little about the John R. Jones Memorial Library here at Blackwater College. We regard the library as a gateway to the resources that you as students at the college may need. The majority of you are full-time students you may find you spend a lot of time here. Even those of you who are part-time students will no doubt require the services too. I hope that by the end of this short talk you will know the services the library has to offer, including the website and how to get any further help you may need. Oh, sorry, I forgot there may be a few distance learners on the tour today. I'll explain about the online facilities and borrowing by post scheme a little later on. This is the main site of the library, but we also have the Rivergate building and the Fieldhouse library. The Rivergate building houses the geography resources, that is the book collection and the journal collection, as well as the map collection. The hours and days of opening of the Rivergate collection are the same as this building, except that it is closed on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. The Fieldhouse Library contains a specialist collection of local history, and if you want to visit it, you will need to make an appointment. Those two facilities are the only exceptions to the rule that all the Blackwater College libraries are open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. However, to gain access to the facilities, you must have your ID card. No ID card, no entry. We have heard all the stories and excuses and we don't accept any of them. Just remember your ID card. Before you listen to the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now answer questions 16 to 20. Now, I must apologise for the mess you can see around you today. Libraries should be quiet places, but unfortunately this is not currently the case here. This new building has been here for only two months, and as a result we have not quite finished moving in. So far, we have moved most of the book and journal collections from the old library into this new building. There are two exceptions. We are currently moving the economics collection here, which should be installed by tomorrow, and we will be moving the French literature collection into this building next week. But as you can see, we are still building the new restaurant. Uh, we will finish it, we hope, <laughs> very shortly. We have finished the cafe, however, and students can use it during the library opening hours. We have recently installed 150 computer places and we will be adding another 100 shortly so that there will be plenty for everybody very soon. Very shortly this library will be one of the finest in this part of the country.
Don't forget that the library isn't just about academic books. In addition to the books and journals, there is a wide range of national newspapers available from the librarians on request. I'd like to mention the different ways you can get help in using our resources. Don't forget our website at www.mlbc.ac.uk. There are the full catalogues, and journal access is available if you have your password and ID number. Now, any questions? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 You will hear some students talking about an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions, 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Tom. Hello, Anne. What have you been doing? Oh, just sitting around, catching up with some reading. I've had a great time. You know we're doing this assignment on... what is it? Museums, their costs and benefits. <laughs> That's right. Well, I've been to the Sangate Museum. It was really good. These local museums are really interesting because they connect people with the history of one special place. We all know about kings and emperors and battles and wars, but local museums tell us about the everyday lives of ordinary people, and that's why they are so important. I'm not so sure about that. I think they are of interest, but they're so small that they can't give a true picture. They do their best. I don't really agree. They do give a true picture, but perhaps not a full picture. It's the truth, but not the whole truth. I think the smallness is the number one problem. Because they're small and local, they attract few visitors. That's why they have so little money. And because they have little money, they can't buy or maintain many really interesting exhibits. As a result, the shop is almost as big as the museum to try to raise money by selling souvenirs, postcards, sweets and so on. I think they find it difficult, but not impossible. And don't forget, they get a lot of their exhibits free from local people. There was this boat, for example, that was fantastic. Really? What was that? There was a massive fishing boat, a real one, about a hundred years old, and you could walk on it and get the feeling of what fishing in those days was really like. Mmm, sounds quite good. Mm. But I've always found that these kinds of museums are a bit dingy. For example, the display cabinets are so dark that you can hardly see the exhibits, and the labels are sometimes difficult to read. Before you listen to the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now answer questions 26 to 30. So coming back to our assignment, what we've got to decide is whether these museums should be funded by the government or just by local people. I think it depends entirely on what kind of museum it is. How do you mean? Well, take local history museums. They are small, so they won't survive without financial support. But that should come from the local authority since only people in that area, or tourists, will visit it. I agree, but what about big natural history museums? 
Surely they should get money from the central government. Why? Children who want to learn about nature can go out into the countryside with their school teachers.、Mm. They could survive from donations, and they get loads of visitors anyway. The state should spend more on science museums, since not enough people are studying science these days.、Mm. I'm not so sure, but I do think a sort of museum which should not get public funds is the craft museum. Yes, like museums of cotton weaving. Yeah, which are of interest to only a very small number of people, and they should pay for it. I agree, but a working farm is a different thing again.、Mm. That's something from the past of all of us, and so it's important to the local community. Kids can learn a lot too. That's the sort of thing that the local government should be spending its money on. Yes, I agree. Well, I think we've got plenty of ideas for our assignment. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about product life cycles. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. I am going to begin my lecture today with a look at product life cycles. Now, as we go through the product life cycle, I will be trying to raise some issues which are important with regard to each phase of the cycle. I won't have all the answers for you this morning. This one of the lecture series is just to get you started, and I hope interested. Let's start with the first phase of the cycle, that of product design. This is really the most important part of the cycle. We often talk as if it is consumers who are responsible for recycling, and so they are. But in reality, the major responsibility must be borne by designers. They can design products where recycling is easy and cheap, or difficult and expensive. In the latter case. The likelihood is that recycling, though technically feasible, will not in fact take place. Now, don't jump ahead because the second stage is not product manufacturing, but rather that of materials acquisition. This is the activity we do when we mine coal or other minerals such as gold or iron or copper. In addition to mining. There is harvesting, which includes the cutting down of trees as a first step in the making of furniture or paper, or fishing. These activities have costs, which are not only money costs. Pollution is one of the extra costs. We have also to think whether the resources we use are renewable, such as trees, or not, such as coal and other minerals. The third stage is not manufacturing either. It is materials processing. This is where we take the raw materials and use energy to change them into a form that can be used in manufacturing.、Uh, for example, trees must be turned into paper or oil into plastic. The cotton plants that grow in the fields must be turned into cloth. All of these activities require the use of chemical processes, and as with all chemical processes, waste is produced. Often of a dangerous kind, and now we come to the manufacturing stage. This is usually the most expensive in terms of cost and energy and waste. The wastes are often those that contribute to global climate change. For example, we make forty-one billion glass containers, mostly bottles, each year. 
and we throw most of them away. A lot of manufacturing seems unnecessary if we could only organize things better. And this could mean greater profits for the manufacturing companies too. Stage 5 is packaging. Many products are packed in paper or plastic, which themselves, of course, have their own processes and costs. Excessive packaging is often criticised, but it must be remembered that packaging serves a purpose, often more than one purpose, such as maintaining freshness and hygiene, as well as providing information. In our globalised world, we must never forget the next stage, which is distribution. This is the stage where transportation and energy play a big part. Lorries, trucks, trains, planes and ships all use up the precious stocks of oil and, as we know, generate greenhouse gases which, as we hear again and again, contribute to climate change. Stage 7 is the point of it all. Using the product. Looking after products, using them in the recommended ways, timely repair and maintenance all reduce the need for early replacement and reduce the number of products in landfill sites. We should not encourage the purchase of single-use products, that is, products which are designed for use on one occasion only and then to be thrown away and replaced. Um, I'm going to skip a stage for a moment and move straight on to the final stage, which is disposal, putting the product in the bin. This is the end of the life of the product and we lose it completely. It may have only a little value, but it does have a value even at this stage of its life, even in fact when it's actually in the landfill site. Now, I missed out one stage. This is a cycle within a cycle. That is, within the life cycle of the product, there can be a closed loop cycle which can extract more value from the product. This is the reuse and recycle loop. It is a closed loop because, in theory, it can continue forever, though in practice, of course, this is not possible. Recycling products mean that they can be used to make more of the same product. Uh, CDs, bottles, books, or that they can be used to make different ones. For example, one pound of recycled paper can make six cereal boxes. And if we recycled all our newspapers, we could save 40,000 trees a day. Now, with this approach to the life cycle of a product in mind, we can go on to consider life cycle analysis. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.